Thank you all for coming back here for the second half of this multi-threading journey that we're on. Um, is anybody here who wasn't in the first talk? Welcome. Thank you so much for coming in. Not a problem, not to worry. I'm going to be building on some things that I mentioned in the previous talk, but I'm going to review from first principles the pieces that will be important for this part. So don't worry about a thing. And um, for those of you who were here, thank you so much. And uh, apparently there's a few more folks coming in the door, so I'll hold on for just another second here. Um, and uh, <laughs> we'll be ready to go here momentarily. So do you ever use volatile at all anymore? A question, thank you. Do I ever use volatile at all anymore? Um, yeah, I, I really like seeing volatile in code reviews because it means there's a bug. <laughs> In modern C++ programming, if you used volatile, you almost certainly meant to use atomic. And it's really, really rare that it's actually what you meant. Um, it, it may be of interest, there's a discussion heating up on the WG21 mailing list about what volatile should not be on the mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I, so apparently there's a discussion going on about what volatile should mean in the future. Um, my proposal would be um, using volatile equals deprecated, and then that would really make a lot of code a great deal better. What about embedded environments? Um, in embedded environments, occasionally it's what you want, and if volatile is actually what you want, then you know enough of the standard to know that it's the right answer. <laughs> But it's very rare in typical C++ code that most of us will be working on. Um, it's, it's almost certainly not doing what you expected. And apparently my clicker has decided to not come back from its lunch break quite as quickly as the rest of us. Thank you. So as we've all been thinking about and mulling over the ideas of multi-threading and a lot of the complexities over the break, in this second half of the talk, I want to address why multi-threading is so complicated. I'm not going to say hard. Multi-threading is not hard. That's a myth, as I mentioned. But it is complex because of the number of assumptions your code makes about what's going on in the machine as each thread executes. I'm going to show you some examples of multi-threading that is at least close to correct. And we can talk about some of the various issues there. And then I'm going to show you a better way to build some tools for using multi-threading in an effective way on top of what exists in the C++ language and about some future plans for this new library that will help your multi-threaded programming. Why is multi-threading complicated? Well, part of the problem is that our abstractions for multi-threading are very low level and communication about them is hard. And I'm not talking about communication in the computer. I'm talking about communication with the rest of your team. Barbara and I do pair programming and every line of code is done as a team. And when we started working on a new signal library as part of Copper Spice, we knew it had to be thread safe. That wasn't a debate. But what we discovered was we weren't using the same language to talk about multi-threading. We didn't have the same definitions. We didn't have the same experience. I had been using multi-threading for years in Unix under POSIX using pthreads. And that was the vocabulary and definitions that I brought to the system. Barbara had been using a lot of multi-user systems as a client of those systems. And so when I said lock, I thought I meant what a POSIX lock, what the behavior and semantics of that lock was. And when she heard that, she thought record lock, because that's what database systems that support multi-user access all think in terms of. So defining your terms is very challenging and making sure that everybody on your team is on the same page when you use a word is very important because there's a lot of opportunity for miscommunication. And this is particularly bad because the tools that we're working with are so low level. Multi-threading is invariably complicated when you have data that needs to be shared among threads. You have some shared data structure that needs to be maintained in a coherent fashion. 
And unfortunately, we had this in Copper Spice because in the destructor of two classes, there were references to each other. These references had to be cleaned up during destruction. And it's very difficult to do this in a safe manner without blocking. Another reason why multi-threading is complicated is because mutex is a rather odd and abstract concept. A mutex is a thing. Well, what's its behavior? Well, you can lock it. Well, what does that mean? I don't know. What does it mean to unlock it? When do you lock and unlock it? It's not defined by the language or the abstractions that we're using. And you can see here, I have a couple of different types of mutexes. Some of these are from newer versions of C++. So STD mutex is in C++ 11. For shared timed mutex, you need to go to 14. And I have some various ways to lock these mutexes. You can acquire a lock guard object. Well, why is it called lock guard? Well, I don't know. And then there's a unique lock. Well, why is the word lock the first word in this case and the last word in the other cases? Well, that's kind of confusing. I, I don't particularly care for some of the nomenclature that's in the standard. That adds confusion to an already complex subject. So here's a wonderful example of how to think about mutexes and the issues that they solve and cause. So imagine we have a phone booth. And if you're having trouble imagining that, go to England where I'm reliably informed they still exist. And suppose that you have multiple people trying to use the phone at the same time. And we make a rule that says, if you want to use the phone, you must first put your hand on the door handle. And you must hold your hand on the door handle the entire time you're on the phone. And then once you're done with the phone, you can let go of the door handle. Well, this sounds kind of silly. What does a door handle have to do with a phone? And I could use any arbitrary object for this. What if I said the mutex, instead of being the door handle, was the third screw from the roof on the left of the enclosure? Well, that would look really strange. You'd be standing there with your finger on the third screw. But it would have exactly the same effect. There's no association between any of these objects. They're completely unrelated other than the meaning that we give to them by the way we use these objects consistently throughout the program. And I'd like to briefly go over an example that I used in the previous talk to show you how complex multi-threading can get. And this is actually solving a not particularly complex problem. I've got a restaurant. I've got some shared resources. I've got two kinds of ovens and an ice cream maker that are needed to prepare different dishes. And I have people showing up who want to order food from this restaurant. I create my oven and an oven mutex. I create another oven and an oven mutex. I've got an ice cream maker and an ice cream maker mutex. Well, now I've got some nomenclature that I need to make sure I have right. And I'm not sure I have the capitalization right on that one. But hopefully, you read the code enough to see that. And then I've got some food. I define what it means to eat food so that we'll have a simple output when a patron is served their food. I set up a patron ticket and a chef ticket, which are two parts that are associated to each other so that the patron can take their order number and place it on the table. And the chef can take the information about the order, prepare it, and at some later time when the food is available, it is moved from the chef to the patron and they can eat. I have some patrons that order some food and eat it. These aren't too bad. There's not a lot of explicit threading code in here. It's fairly readable. If I were looking at this during a code review, I wouldn't find much issue with this section of code. I have an implementation of some chefs that take orders off an order queue and fulfill those orders by simply processing them. And we covered in the last um, talk a good bit about how this can be improved and optimized, but this is a reasonable working example for our purposes. But then we get to how to actually order a pizza. And I have this code where I have a chef ticket that I create. I use a shared pointer because I don't want to make this lambda non-copyable. And if I were to capture by move, it would be non-copyable. That can sometimes be an issue. 
but that's an implementation detail. I create the chef ticket, I create the patron ticket. I set up this work to be done later. This is an order that's going to be placed on the queue. And I define how all of the various steps in this order should be processed. And then toward the end, I set the value of my chef ticket, and this is the point at which the waiter or whoever's responsible for it will take the pizza that's been baked and move it to the patron who wants to eat. Now, there's some interesting issues with this example, and one was brought up during the break that I'd like to highlight, which is that ordering is very important in threaded code. If I were to move this line of code that gets the patron ticket down after queuing the order, I could have a potential race condition because I might not get the patron ticket until the pizza had been baked. So that would be a problem. So I already know when I'm looking at multi-threaded code, I have to be very careful about the order of operations because one of the assumptions that you're looking for is what order of operations am I assuming that other threads will do in my context? And we have two different threads here because we have the work that's going to be done immediately on the outside of this function, this function executes immediately and returns a patron ticket. And then we have this inner block, which is the work that's going to be done later by another thread. The other thing I see as I'm looking through this code is one of these lines is not like the others. Because this is all information about how we're going to pass the food once it's been created and fully baked back to the patron. That's important. I can't omit that. These lines are about sending the order to the chef and returning the ticket back to the patron. That's important. I can't omit that. Well, inside here, while I'm talking about how to create a pizza and make some, and add some sauce to it, add some cheese. Those are important. I don't want a pizza without cheese. I can't omit those. And I need to bake. And I need to give the pizza to the waiter to be conveyed to the patron. But there's one line in here that has nothing to do with any of my implementation objects. I have a lock guard. Well, that's just some random class out of the standard. It doesn't have anything to do with my implementation. STD mutex, okay, that's a template parameter. Fine, I'm okay with that. There's a name, lock. What does lock mean? It's a completely arbitrary name. It has no bearing on anything else in this code. And what am I locking? A brick oven mutex. What does brick oven mutex have to do with any other object in my program? Nothing. It's a completely isolated object that has no purpose. So hold that thought for a moment. And let's look at some slightly simpler code. Let's look at even some single threaded code. What do we as modern C++ programmers think of this code? If this came up in a code review from one of your coworkers, what would your first comment be? Exceptions. Exceptions. What about exceptions? This is not exception safe. Why is it not exception safe? No RII, RIA, RAII, sorry. <laughs> The argument names are silly. Okay, that's true. That's a good code review comment. That's not the biggest problem with this code, however. The biggest problem with this code, in my opinion, is that there is a raw pointer pointing to a stack or a heap allocated object. <laughs> hopefully, that's a very good point. This new, well, what do you mean by hopefully, actually? It's not initialized to a null pointer. That's true. That actually turns out not to be a problem in standard compliant compilers because this new will throw if it fails. So you can't get to the following code if the allocation fails. So that's one of the few problems this code doesn't have. <laughs> Why is this code challenging? Well, it's not just challenging. It's, well, it's not wrong. You can't look at this code in isolation and say it's wrong. We could be in an environment where we know there are no exceptions being thrown. If these two methods do not throw exceptions, this code is exception safe because there aren't any. But this code looks wrong to a modern C++ programmer. So how do we fix this? Well, what if I put a, a comment 
up at the top of this code that says, don't forget to delete the object you allocated. Does that fix the problem? Yes. Several people are saying yes. I'm a little concerned. <laughs> what if I wrap a bunch of try-catch blocks around all of these? Seems like a terrible idea. How do I know who's responsible for deleting this object? Uh, unique pointer would be a good idea. That would make this code look a lot better. My point is, there are assumptions in this code. This is perfectly normal code, well, apart from the fact that these are method calls. This would be perfectly normal code in many C programming styles. This would be very common to have something formatted like this where the caller assumes responsibility for the memory. But we don't do that in C++ anymore. Or if we do, we don't feel good about it. <laughs> or, we or we shouldn't. There's got to be a better way. And of course there is. So let's look at another example. Let's talk about a very simple cache that needs to be thread safe. Well, so I've got an insert and a lookup method. These are fairly straightforward signatures. I've got a map that contains my information. I'm not going to worry about expiring objects from the cache at this point. And I've got a cache mutex. How many ways is it possible for this code to be mutated into something that's wrong? If you're maintaining this code and you're adding something to this code, how many ways is it possible to mess up this behavior? A large number of them. Because this cache mutex has no association with mcache. There's no con construct that's tying these together. So I know what I should do because I'm a good C programmer and I understand the value of documentation. So I'll put a comment up here that says, don't forget to lock the cache mutex if you're going to touch the cache. How's that for a solution? Does that sound like a good plan? This is where we still are in most code bases in multi-threading C++ code. So any issues with this example as written? Does anybody see a problem with it? You can get a race condition when you use a complicated object. Okay, so I think if I'm understanding that correctly, you're saying if two threads call lookup and they get the same complicated object back. Okay, so there's a potential race if, if there's some code in this cache that deletes the objects that belong to it, then you could definitely have a race condition where the cache is deleting an object where another thread is using it. That's absolutely true. That's a problem. Not only deletion, but a modification. If, if complicated object is not itself thread safe, I have a problem here. That's absolutely true. The lifetime of the complicated object isn't related to the lifetime of my cache. That's absolutely true, because there's no code, uh, there is no destructor here. I haven't declared one. So this, this code, again, it seems odd and not correct. I, I haven't found a bug yet. I have found a lot of things which are potential bugs. It's not obvious that you could even write a It's not obvious that you could write a correct destructor. That's true. Very good. That's a very important point. Let me address that specifically. So the reason why I find this code so interesting is because I wrote this code to demonstrate one problem. And since I used raw pointers, there are many problems other than the one I was trying to show. <laughs> I gave this piece of code to Barbara to put in a slide and she looked at it and I said, there are there's one problem in here that I would like you to find. 
and make sure that this code is correct and illustrates what I'm trying to do. And she found a problem, and I said, oh, okay, there are two problems, find the next one. <laughs> okay, there are three. Okay, there are four. <laughs> it's almost an infinite number of defects in this code. So we have a lot of problems. We return a raw pointer, that's sketchy. We shouldn't be doing that. What if someone else deletes the object? What if I delete the object, but I don't remove it from the map? That's another way to mess up this code. But here's the real problem. If you look at this access here, this is using the array operator on a map. What's the behavior of the array operator on a map if the element is not found? It creates a new one and initializes it. It value initializes it, so at least it initializes it to a null pointer. But I have a shared lock. This is a read lock. I should not be able to do this. I have undefined behavior. If any other thread is doing this at the same time, I have concurrent rights to this data structure. This is a problem, and it's a hard to see problem. I declared it const. That's true, so the compiler will see it. So, this isn't the version that I compiled. This is the version that I first thought of. But then I said, okay, well, I, I declared this const, and the pattern when you have a const accessor to a thread safe object is you mark all the data you're going to use mutable. So I put mutable here and here. So now the compiler can't help me because I've said that these data structures are mutable. Now, if I know enough about multi-threading and about the const correctness of multi-threaded code, I can be aware enough to make the mutex mutable, but not the data it protects. And then the compiler will catch it. But that's a big if. And that depends on the existence of one keyword in the right place and another keyword not being in the corresponding place. I don't like code that's one keyword away from a subtle multi-threading bug that the compiler can't catch. So hopefully I've convinced you that this code is broken in many obvious ways and in a subtle way. I don't like this. Because the other problem is since this code is so dangerous, I'll probably find the obvious ways during a code review. And then the meeting will be over and we'll run out of time to find the really hard ones that are race conditions that will show up at runtime later. I have a problem with this. So let's look at a better way to deal with shared data in a multi-threaded program. And the fundamental concept is that a mutex, I think we should now start calling a raw mutex, because a mutex is just as dangerous as a pointer. A raw mutex should not exist undecorated in your code. It shouldn't exist as a separate entity because it doesn't have any meaning. We're C++ programmers, we're about assigning meaning to collections of objects that have a purpose. So let's create a guarded variable instead of a mutex. So as far as data goes, this is just an object and a mutex tied together. That's all it is. What's important is that it has the same lock, try lock, lock for behavior as a standard mutex does. It's a thing you can lock. But when you lock it, what do you get back? Well, in a standard mutex, you get back a void, which tells you nothing. In a guarded of T, you get back a handle, which is the only way you can access the data that is protected by that mutex. And we have a constructor that will simply forward the arguments through to the constructor of the underlying type. So a guarded T, when you create it, it acts a lot like a T. It's not copyable, even if T is, because copying shared data, uh, sorry, it's not movable. Um, nor is it copyable, because that's not necessarily what you want. But it looks like a combination of a mutex and an object. This is what we want. So then, when we lock a guarded variable, what we do is, internally, we're using the standard unique lock class, we're acquiring, a mutex, we're acquiring a lock on the mutex, and then we're returning a new handle, the address of the object that we're protecting, 
and we're passing a custom deleter and we're passing this unique lock to the deleter so that we now have a unique pointer that when it goes out of scope will unlock the object. Try lock is fairly simple. You can implement it in terms of try lock in the underlying mutex, assuming that the underlying mutex has a try lock. And note, when you, re when you get a handle back from try lock, you get a valid one if the lock succeeded, or a null pointer if the lock didn't. Well, this is nice. Null pointer is a pretty standard way to deal with that operation failed. I have a unique pointer. It's null. I can test for that. It's fairly clear in the code what's going on here. What's the deleter look like? Well, it's actually not that complex. We're going to accept the unique lock that was locked earlier. We're going to accept it by value. It's going to be moved into the deleter. We move it into a member variable. And then all we do in the um, operator of the deleter, well, we don't actually want to delete the object. That's not our responsibility. What we're going to do is just unlock the lock that we had. Question? Can I go back one slide? Sure. On the else condition, it seems like we're locking things too long this way. That's correct. Um, um, there is a complexity here, which is not immediately obvious, which is in this else condition, lock is not locked. So I'm moving an unlocked unique lock. So there's no lock held. If, if this fails, there is no lock to forward to the deleter. Does that answer your question? Okay. In the else condition, why bother with the custom deleter and the lock object? Well, the issue there is the deleter is part of the data type in unique pointer. It's not hidden as it is in shared pointer. It's not encapsulated at the creation site. So I have to have a deleter. I could potentially create a different constructor for deleter, a default constructor which would then create a lock that's unlocked. That would also work. It, it, I like the um, symmetry of this solution. It turns out not to have any cost over and above having another constructor. So now we have a deleter. Well, this isn't quite enough to solve the problem that we had with the cache, though, because guarded is a read-write exclusive lock on its, its object. So let's create shared guarded. Well, it's pretty straightforward as well. I have the same type of handle. I have a unique pointer. I have the same lock, try lock, everything. Just like in the standard library, a shared mutex is just a superset of the operations that are available on a standard mutex. Then I create a shared handle which is a separate data type. It's a unique pointer to a const t. And I have a shared deleter. These are very symmetric with the other operations. I now have to have this mutex mutable. But since I only have to write this once, and this is in a library, I'm OK with the fact that this has to be mutable and t has to be non-mutable, because you only have to get this right once. And then inside the code, our lookup function now looks like this. So I've removed all the raw pointers because that was the first pass of the code review. If you have a multi-threaded program, and especially if you have some sort of a cache like this, and you're using raw pointers, you have a race condition. Either it's a use after free or a memory leak or something. With a sh returning a shared pointer, you can be guaranteed that object won't be destroyed. Even if the cache is done with it, until all of the users of that object are done with it. Now in here, note, we don't need to make mcache mutable because lock shared is a const method. 
on shared guarded. So when we do the lock shared, we get back a shared handle. I've conveniently called handle here. And we do our find and our looking at the iterator to see if it was found or return a null pointer. If I try to write the version with the, op the array operator, the index operator here, it won't compile. Because handle is a unique pointer to a const map. Because I have a shared handle, I should not be able to modify that data. Does that make sense? By wrapping the data along with the mutex that protects it, I'm able to pass semantic information about the lock you acquired that is important for how you can use the object. So now, let's write insert, which I didn't even show on the previous slide because it was too error prone. So how does this look? So we're going to get an exclusive lock. Note that this is lock, not lock shared. And we're going to add this element to the map. Any problems here? More importantly, can you, by looking at this code, see whether there are problems? Is this code simple enough to reason about? Any questions on that? Comments, concerns? OK, people seem happy. The idea that this code is simple enough to look at and understand is really important in multi-threaded programming. So popping back for a second. In my previous talk, I said there are a couple of questions you should ask about any given piece of code. Could we have a deadlock here? No. no. We only have one resource. We're only acquiring one lock here. There's no opportunity for deadlock. Do we have a race condition? We don't have a race condition because it's a guarded variable. End of story. You don't have to go any further in that sentence. Once I declared this as a shared guarded, there are no race conditions. I don't have to know what any of the code below it looks like. This is a really nice property to have in your code. You can look at the declaration of a class and see that it is thread safe because its members are guarded. Well, there's one thing that I don't entirely like about this code. Or not this code, but code that you might come up with as part of modifying this structure. If you decide to do additional work in the insert, for example, if you're going to do an insert and then walk the structure and see if things need to be expired and maybe delete them and maybe you have another data member that says how many elements there are in your structure, it starts to become more complex, you might run into the opportunity for deadlocks. So in my opinion, there's a subtle bug, not in this code, but in this definition. Because you can misuse it. Now, a shared lock is okay, because a shared lock is a read lock. It's very hard to have a deadlock if all of your code is getting read locks. But a write lock is kind of a dangerous thing to have laying around in your code with easy access to it. So let's encapsulate the operation of updating the cache. Let's make it so you don't have access to the write lock side of this. So let's look at an ordered guarded variable. So we have the same shared handle that we had for a shared guarded. Because shared handles are OK. I don't mind having a lot of those out in the program. But now, instead of a try lock and a lock, I'm going to add a modify function that takes a function object and applies that modification to the data that's contained in this guarded variable. The rest of the, the lock shared is exactly the same as for shared guarded. This all comes out exactly the same way. I have the same object, the same mutex. So internally, there's no change in the implementation. But now, my modify function is the only function that can lock Get, get an exclusive lock on this data. And all it does is get an exclusive lock and then apply this function to the object. 
And at first glance, this may seem kind of trivial. And like I've just rearranged the lines of code from the caller into the library. This is what code using this now looks like. I have no explicit locking at all. I have a modify, I pass in a lambda that says the operation to do. The parameter to the lambda is the data. So the lambda is past the guarded data and it can do whatever it likes with that data. But I have no way to access the lock that was acquired. So I can't pass the lock out of this lambda. I, it can't escape this modification function, which means I know if there are no other resources accessed inside this lambda, there are no deadlocks. I can guarantee that by inspecting the code, and I only have to inspect this much code to know that there are no deadlocks. I only have to look at one line of code to know that my algorithm is deadlock free. That's a kind of a neat property. Any questions on that? I called it ordered guarded because these modifications occur in some total order. They occur in the order that they were submitted to the guarded object. And the reason why it's important to note that is because the next class is deferred guarded. And this one has some very interesting properties. Now by generalizing the concept of modification to be an operation rather than a handle that the code gets back, we can do a very interesting thing. So here in deferred guarded, I've got the modification technique that I applied to ordered guarded, except there's now two kinds of modify. Depending upon whether you want information back from the modification or not. You can do a modify detach, which says this is a fire and forget operation. I want this mutation of the object to happen at some point later. Maybe not now. It may well be executed now, but it might not be. You get no information back from modify detach, returns void. On the other hand, you can do a modify async which returns this rather long and complicated template deduction, which turns out to be whatever the function returns. So whatever the return value of this function object is, when it's called, that's what this future will give you back. So I now have a way that I can send an operation into this guarded variable and get a result back at some point later. Why do I care about this? Anybody have any idea why this is important? I can do other things while I'm waiting for it to finish. Turns out to have another important property. A lot of the code is exactly the same for the shared side, but now I need a little more information. I need information that there is a write operation pending in case there was a write operation that couldn't be completed immediately. And I need a vector of the operations that are pending. And I'm going to use a guarded vector because I don't want to have to deal with locking it internally. So I know that this code has no race conditions. Whatever implementation I have below this in the class. So now my insert looks almost exactly the same as it did in the last example. I'm just using modify detach instead of modify because I don't care what this lambda, when it's going to execute, and it's not going to give me any information back. I just want to throw this piece of information in and have it go into the map at some point. And the really cool thing about a cache is the at some point doesn't have to be exactly defined. It's a cache. Negative results are perfectly allowed. Two slides, sure. So I see you have a mutex here. What is that mutex pr protecting if all you've got is an atomic and a guard in here? That's an excellent question. That mutex, now here's, here's another interesting piece. This is a guarded class that handles read and write access. 
to its um, underlying data structures. However, I only need one mutex to protect it. This is a shared time mutex. So internally, this mutex is required because I need to um, serialize modifications to the data structure. So internally, when you um, do a modify call, it's going to try to lock this mutex exclusively. If it succeeds, it'll do the modification immediately. If it fails, it will put that modification on the deferred queue, where later, at some later access, it will say, okay, are there any pending rights? Can I lock this mutex exclusively? I'll do the deferred rights now. Does that answer your question? Couldn't I do it in the terms of shared guarded that I just implemented? Um, actually could. I could have put this mutex and this object together as a shared guarded. That's true. I could implement these in terms of one another. Um, that's an enhancement that sounds like a good idea. So as I said, my insert doesn't look that much different than the previous example. This isn't that difficult to reason about, but I have a change have a fundamental behavioral change. Remember I said before, I have to inspect this code to see if this algorithm is deadlock free because I want to make sure it doesn't acquire any other resources or block or anything like that. Well, when I declared, sorry, when I declared the deferred guarded variable in my class, at that moment I know it's deadlock free because deferred guarded is deadlock free, always because it can always defer this operation to a point at which it can be executed without deadlock. This is a really cool technique. So we've taken what started out as a simple way to attach together a mutex and the object it protects. We've created a structure for synchronization that's guaranteed deadlock free, no matter what values you have in it, no matter what operations you perform on it. Comments? Excellent question. So the question was, when is the pending list processed and flushed? And the answer is, it's in the lock shared. Because when you acquire, when you want to acquire shared access, the first thing it does is check, are there any pending rights? Can I acquire an exclusive lock? If I can, I'll process them. If not, I will simply return a shared handle immediately to the old value of the data. So this is an eventual consistency synchronization system, which is not always what you want, but it has this really nice property that it's deadlock free. So you can guarantee the behavior of the system as a whole. Do I have any limitations on vector size? Um, I'm not sure quite what you mean by that. Is the queue unbounded? Yes, the queue is unbounded. And one of the enhancements that I'd like to make is make this queue uh, parameterized type so that you could specify your own queue that would be bounded or whatever. Um, since your code is managing mutex, um, couldn't you check the queue at the time you unlock from a previous operation? The question was, would it make sense to check the queue at the time you unlock from a previous operation rather than when you lock? Um, are you talking about when you unlock the exclusive lock of a previous operation? Yeah. Or um, that's, not an, uh, that's not really a factor because any thread that gets an exclusive lock to the mutex will apply all of the pending rights, not just one of them. So it doesn't matter whether you check at the beginning or the end of a shared lock operation. Um, and it also, exactly, it doesn't matter which thread the pending rights are executed on, and they will always be executed as soon as this data structure discovers that it can get an exclusive lock. 
So it also checks at the beginning of each of these modify functions. It checks, is this, uh, you know, can I acquire an exclusive lock? If so, immediately execute all the pending work and this modification. Okay, so the scenario I was thinking of is you have this thread performing a modification immediately. It has a lock held. This other thread comes in and wants to perform a modification. It can't get the lock, and so it puts it on the queue. And I was thinking about immediately executing the deferred write as soon as the first thread unlocks. Interesting point. So you're talking about when there's two modifications started concurrently, and one of them wins the, essentially the race for the mutex, starts doing the modification. The other one puts it on the deferred queue, should it be immediately executed as soon as the first thread is done. That adds additional synchronization overhead to do the additional checking from the thread that won to see if the queue has been repopulated while it was working. It's not clear that that overhead is a win. So in that case, if nobody does, if nobody comes and does uh, a lock later or another write, don't we end up with orphan jobs? If nobody does a lock or a write, then who cares if there are orphan jobs because nobody's observing the state of the guarded object. And if, yes, yes, so the, the check is done in modify detach, modify async, and all of the lock shared methods to see if there, if there are pending writes, then try to get an exclusive lock and execute any pending writes. So you get eventual consistency, as many modifications as possible without causing a deadlock. Do you need to? Do you need? So the question was: Do you need to um, execute the task queue at the destruction of the deferred guarded object? And that is actually a really good question. You do need to, because they could have side effects. Because if somebody has called modify async, they actually want information back about the state of the object when the modification is done. So yes, yeah, very good observation. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm still um, I feel like I'm, I'm missing something with the, uh, like, uh, how things get processed out of the mutex list. Okay. Um, uh, so, like, so, so if you have two tests come in at the same time, one of them wins the mutex, the other one gets put in the, the queue. Um, when, when the first one completes, when does that second one, like, who's responsible? Like, if, it's, if it was that the, the um, lock detached uh, mm -hmm. one. It gets dequeued the next time any operation is done on this object. Any time the subsequent modification or shared lock of any type is done. So as soon as somebody observes the state of it again. So uh, I guess maybe this is part of that potential consistency. Is, is, uh, like say, <laughs> say those were the only two things that were, that were uh, uh, tasks that were carried out. Um, and if the program shuts down, then that second task will never actually well, if the program shuts down, then the destructor of ordered guarded will, or, sorry, of deferred guarded will execute all of these pending tasks. And so they will eventually occur. That's why it's eventual consistency. And the eventual might be all the way to static destruction. Mm -hmm. Other questions came up? What is the behavior when the queue is saturated? Um, it, oh, if you have a bounded queue. If you have a bounded queue, assuming that the queue like throws an exception when you try to insert too many elements, then either modify detach or modify async will throw that exception. In a completely exception safe manner, you'll find out that your attempt to queue that operation failed. there's no behavior to check the return of pushback in this. It's
response to QC greater than the uh, client who calls uh, for a modification uh, needs to be blocked until the uh, So the question is, if, if this Q down here is full, is there any way for these modify functions to block until the queue isn't full? And the answer is no, because then you lose the property that this class is deadlock free. It's very important that absolutely none of the functions in this, uh, none of the methods in this class can block. Uh, I mean, the, the trial lock shared for and until can block for a determined point, uh, period of time. Um, and actually, lock shared can block but it can't be blocked by other readers. So this is deadlock free. Yeah, so it seems like the implementation now is basically a lazy write. A, la a lazy write, yes, that's a way to look I, at I it. I could see, now, and it makes sense because then you already have the if could be expensive. Mm -hmm. But if the modifiers are expensive, it might be good to have an eager write because I can block, pin a bunch of stuff, and export thread that calls it. I'm sorry, I, I don't quite understand the difference that you made between a lazy write and an eager write. Oh, so right now, kind of like what uh, the other suggestion was is if the lock were held and modifiers were pending, they could go out of the queue. Mm -hmm. At the end of that, or I guess you're still transferring it to another thread there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yes, yeah, so the question is when does the queue flush? If a lock gets pended, the next read may have a timely modifier that's, that, that's correct. And uh, so the question was, if the, if the lock is held, then at some point later, you're going to flush the queue of all the things that came in while that lock was held. I mean, if you think about it, the only things that are going to be in the queue are, things, are modifications that were attempted while the lock was held. If you have modify detach or any of these other methods repeatedly look at the queue while they have the lock held to see if there's more work to do, then they become unbounded in the amount of time that they take to execute. If you only run through the things that were queued before that operation, then you have a, an upper bound on the amount of time that function can execute. So if you were to continually look at and see if there was more work, you can't hit a deadlock, but you could hit a live lock if there's too much work to be done. That's very difficult to mitigate. Are there other questions on this area? Um, so the question was, how do you deal with exceptions or errors in the right portion of this? And the answer is, if you want to know about exceptions or errors, you have to use modify async, because you will get a future back that you can check to see if the write succeeded or not. Um, and it's, it's perfectly valid for this function to return void. And then you'll get an STD future of void that will tell you whether the function completed successfully or not and no other information. Any questions? Yes, lock shared is definitely one of the functions that can flush the queue. Uh, it, it does, uh, in, uh, does it uh, take uh, exclusive block for the, all this, all this uh, tasks to be done? Um, so the question was, does lock shared take an exclusive lock for all the tasks to be done? And the answer is yes, but only if the lock can be acquired. It does a tr it, so if the pending rights is true, there's something to be done, we're going to try to acquire an exclusive lock. If that fails, we lost the race, somebody is using the data, somebody else will try again later. So it's kind of an uh, unusual contract that you call lock shared, but in fact it can it's a good, uh, take an exclusive lock. Yes, lock shared can definitely take an exclusive lock, but the important thing is the exclusive lock is only held inside lock shared. It won't wait for an exclusive lock to be available. So this is bounded. It may take some time because it may have to flush the queue. But it won't wait for an exclusive lock if one is not available. Yes. 
So all of the functions that observe or modify the queue will execute the entire queue that existed at the moment it acquired the exclusive lock. Otherwise, there are some very interesting corner cases you get into where certain tasks take a long time to get executed. If you have enough readers hitting, then, then you'll never get a chance to, to get your exclusive lock to make them flush your queue out. That is true. If you have enough readers active at a time, then you may never get writes posted to the data. That, that there's really no way around that other than some mechanism to say when the queue gets to a certain size, we need to stop the readers and somehow wait for the existing readers to go away and make the modifications. Now, the interesting thing about this, this scheme of looking at guarded data is that algorithm I just described is quite complex to implement correctly. However, you could implement it correctly and your interface would be exactly this. So you can plug in a new implementation of an algorithm for doing eventual consistency with no change in API. Your calling code doesn't even have to know that it changed. So I would definitely be curious to see somebody implement that. But it's not trivial. So we have all this, but what if I really don't want the behavior where getting a shared lock can take a while and can block. And maybe I'm okay that the writes could block for a while, but I don't really like the shared locks having a significant amount of time to complete. So what's the best way to make sure a lock doesn't take a long time to get acquired? Don't lock. So, there is a really great algorithm, there's a PhD paper on it, called the left-right algorithm, which shows us exactly how to do this. And it has the property that we can now go back to a regular modify. This modify will block, because writers can block with the LR algorithm. However, the readers never block, ever. We need a lot more information to deal with this algorithm. We need a count of how many readers are looking at each object because the way this works is this uses twice as much space as, a, as the previous versions of Guarded. We need two different copies of the data so that readers can be looking at one copy while the writer mutates the other copy and then at a certain point we can swap some information over, write the copy that is now no longer being used as soon as all of those readers are finished with it. We need a mutex that the writer acquires to make sure that no other writer is doing this swap around dance at the same time. And we need a bunch of atomic information that keeps track of who's reading and writing, or rather, how many threads are reading each copy of the data. And we start getting into some rather complicated and hairy code. There are several ways to implement this algorithm in C++. They're all ugly. And this is an area where Thread Sanitizer actually found a bug in my code because I had missed an assignment and it showed me there was a data race in the modification of one of the uh, underlying data structures. So if you have an algorithm, especially if you have a lockless algorithm, that you are copying out of someone else's paper because that is the way you use a lockless algorithm, and you encounter odd bugs, and you would like to know which part of it you copied incorrectly, Ask Clang's thread sanitizer, it will tell you. So I put this code up here not so much to explain how it works internally, because as I said, it's an entire PhD thesis to get all of the ordering on the atomic operations correct. My point is just to show that this is not code you want to write in your program at any point, if possible. And if you do write it, you want to write it once and get it correct. You don't want every client to be doing this. And there's some yields, and we have to spin on various read counts and write counts all through this. And if you forget that line, nothing works. <laughs> Trust me on this. <laughs> there's 
a lot of um, work here to make sure that this is exception safe. But it's exception safe in an interesting way because if the modification function object throws an exception, well, remember, we have two separate data structures. So the modification object has to be called twice. So if it throws an exception the first time, we copy the unchanged object back so that we're in a consistent state and it looks like the modification didn't happen. If it throws an exception the second time, we copy the already modified object to the unchanged one so that the modification did happen. Um, suggestions welcome for a way to expose the information about which case was hit and whether or not the modification occurred, that would be quite useful. But at least you always have a consistent state and if an exception is thrown, you can say with certainty either the modification happened or it did not. There's no inconsistent state. There's no you know, partially formed state that a vector has when an exception is thrown during modification. So you at least have the guarantee that the value is always valid and usable. The reason I bring this all up is because now our code that uses it looks exactly the same as it has during the rest of this talk. Got a question? Uh, why would you want to use a uh, modification uh, function object twice since it could have, uh, could have, uh, have a index or example? So the question was why would you want to use the modification object twice? because that could have side effects, and that's true. And it's important that the modification object not have side effects. The reason why we use it twice is because we have two objects that must be mutated. The only way we can do that is either call the modification object once on one object, wait, and then call it again on the other object, or I could call it once here, and then down here, I could copy one object to the other. If this is a large data structure, that's extremely expensive. So if I'm maintaining my cache, and I have a huge map with thousands of objects in it, I don't want to make an insert and then copy the entire map. That's really expensive. I'd rather just make the same insert in both locations. That's much more efficient. Would it make sense to make the modification object only member functions of the object that's being handled? Um, it might be, but I'm not sure how you could phrase that. I mean, I, this is a very simple API. If you had to pass in a method pointer and bind information into it, and I don't know about you, but I don't ever want to write a boost bind call again in my life. <laughs> we have better technology now. Um, I, I think that the flexibility of this outweighs the um, value of forcing you to only modify the object involved. And that would lock out free function implementations of modifiers. That's true. That would, that would um, prevent you from using free functions as modifiers to an object, which I know a lot of data structures have moved towards. So my, my point is, all you have to look at to know that this is correct is this lambda. If, if this, uh, Will this be correct even if you use a blocking operation inside the lambda? And the answer is yes, because the left-right algorithm states explicitly, modify will block. There is already a blocking operation in here because, whoa, that was interesting. That went way faster than I wanted. Um, there is already a blocking operation in here because when we're finished modifying the currently unused copy of the data, we have to switch some pointers and then wait until all of the readers have moved to the object we've modified before we can modify the second one. So modify must be able to block because modify has to block until all readers that started reading before the modification have finished their work. So my thread might suffer from writer's block. Your thread might suffer from writer's block. That is, that is true, um, except your thread won't suffer from deadlock. Okay. 
because modify can block, but there is not actually a resource being acquired other than the mutex that controls being able to write to the object. Note there's no shared mutex here at all. The readers don't acquire any sort of mutex whatsoever. And that mutex that controls writing is only acquired within this modify function. So assuming that your modification functor terminates, this cannot deadlock. So that's an interesting point, and I, I went back and forth about this in designing this library. It, the comment was that LR guarded exposes an implementation detail of the way this is implemented. And the truth is, it does, but it exposes an implementation detail that must be known. Because it's important that you understand that internally, this object has two copies of the data. And it's important that you understand that writes may block. I don't know of any other algorithm with this property, which is why it's a sufficient label for what this is doing internally. Right. And not just potentially, but it almost certainly will call this twice. So you need to be aware that the API looks very similar but there are important differences in the way that you interact with these various classes. Now, what if you have a data structure where you're okay with writes blocking, but you really don't want reads to block writes? Because it's a lot easier to be sure that your code will always progress if you can be sure that only writes can block other writes. That's often a very useful property. Well, let's create a copy on write guarded variable. Now, I know copy on write is not the way to implement a container library, but it is useful here. And the reason it's useful is because we can implement a copy on write guarded variable. We have our same lock, try lock. We have an exclusive handle. So we've gone back to the model where you can acquire exclusive access and shared access. What do we have internally backing this up? Well, we have an LR guarded shared pointer. Well, what are the rules on LR guarded? Well, we said that writes are only blocked as long as a reader is active. Well, what are we gonna do with this data? We're just gonna read it once, very briefly. So that's a very small period of time that we're going to be working with this, and reads can never be blocked in the LR guarded algorithm. And then we have a write mutex that will protect write access to this data structure. Now we also have a slightly more complex deleter because we're going to be passed information about the lock that was acquired. And this, this is the deleter for exclusive access, not the shared deleter. The shared deleter is actually, it's just a shared pointer. My shared handle type should have been right there. It's a shared pointer of const t. There's no unique pointer, there's no complications. It's just a shared pointer. And that object will be valid for as long as you hold the shared pointer. But in the deleter, I have a little more information that I need. I have a lock. I have the data that's being, the, uh, the, the LR guarded information that I'm going to need. And whether or not this operation has been canceled, well, this is kind of an interesting feature. Since I'm going to make a copy of the data when I start a new write, I can cancel that write. I can throw away the data and say, make it as if this modification didn't happen. Now I pay a price for that, of course. There's a copy. But sometimes that's a useful feature to have in an algorithm. There's a cancel method that just sets cancel to true. But the really interesting bit comes in in the deletion operator of the deleter. So what is a unique pointer? What does the basic deleter do? What does the standard one do? It deletes the pointer that belonged to it. Well, we showed earlier the deleter could unlock something. That's useful. What about if the deleter creates a shared pointer to the thing that's being deleted? So if this operation's been canceled, I don't need this new object 
that's been created, so I'm just going to delete it. If the operation hasn't been canceled, then I'm going to take this object that's about to be deleted, and instead I'm going to wrap it in a shared pointer and change the guarded shared pointer that's internal to this new object. And then if I still own the lock, I'm going to unlock it. This is kind of neat. This is a deleter that's actually a constructor. <laughs> and that's the data that's used to implement this deleter because I need a reference back to the original object so I know where to put the new data when it becomes active. So now, I'm back to the original code. I've come full circle. Now I have a lock that's getting exclusive access, and I have access to that object, and I can do it in place. And I could do a handle arrow cancel right here, and it would be as if the in place didn't happen. So I have a transactional guarded variable. So just to briefly go over the taxonomy of shared, uh, of guarded objects that are available, the guarded T only has exclusive locks. It uses straight C++11. The shared guarded gives you exclusive and shared locks. It requires either C++14 or the mutexes that are in boost thread because it requires a shared mutex of some type. The ordered guarded gives you blocking modifications to shared data via a lambda, and of course shared locks. This one needs a shared lock internally, so it needs 14 or boost thread. The deferred guarded, as I mentioned, is non-blocking modifications, which gives you deadlock-free eventual consistency on your data structure. The LR guarded, we're back to blocking modifications of your data, however, Readers block writers, but readers never block readers, and readers never see data older than the previous write. So you can, depending upon when a reader arrives, it could either see the current state of the object or the state right before the modification that's in progress, but never older than that. And then we have the cow guarded, copy on write system, which gives you shared access without any locking whatsoever, the shared access acquires no locks and does not block. You can do blocking modifications to the data. Only other writers can block writers. So you can, it's much more difficult to get into a deadlock. Readers see a snapshot of data that is valid until they're done with it. And unwanted modifications can be discarded. And this uses only C++11 features. Now another little example of why I like this. Well, remember what I said about comments being the way to correct code? Have you ever seen this in code? Where you have some more complicated API out here, and then you have an internal API, and there's a comment always that says, you must call this method with x lock held. Or do not call this with this lock held. Once again, why is there a comment when we should be able to express this in code? We can express this in code now. Because if I have this as a deferred guarded in this instance, that's just what I picked, and I, I just have a using to make shared handle easier to read. Now I say my internal method takes a shared handle to the cache. You cannot call this method without previously locking the data because there's no way to get a shared handle to the data. You can now express in the parameter list of this method what locks it expects to be held when it's called. Because we guarantee that you can't access this data other than through a handle. Does that sound like a useful addition to our vocabulary for dealing with locks and mutexes? You could pass a reference to a lock in the previous example, except a lock doesn't tell you anything about which mutex it locked. You could pass any lock you want. You could declare a mutex on the stack, lock it, and then pass that in. You're protecting the mutex, you're not protecting the data. <laughs> this actually protects the data. 
then why do we even have this cache object? Since we have an object that's thread safe and easy to work with and has a nice consistent API for locking and unlocking, why not just do this? It's a map. Now I know exactly how it works. I know all the methods. And if I look up deferred guarded, I'll know how to access it. And I don't have to worry about any of this implementation. The only code that has no bugs is the code you didn't write. <laughs> and I avoided writing a lot of code here. Now, we can go back and we went a long way for this, but now I've gotten rid of that line that said lock. And I'm happy because I can look at this code and I can see that there aren't any race conditions and I know that this oven will not be used synchronously by two different threads. Question? Yes, you could, still, you could still surround this by curly braces, or now, since it's a unique pointer, you could do release right here, which is a much clearer way to say what you're doing. I got access to some data, and I'm releasing it. But yes, that's true. So where would I like to go from here? Well, there's no syntax in this. There's no concept for locking a single element of a container, and that would be a really nice thing to have in some cases, when you have a large data set and you want write access to individual elements of it without locking the entire thing. This isn't entirely clear how to integrate this with condition variables. There's an obvious way that's very ugly and gets you right back into the same mess. So there needs to be a little more work done on that. Locking multiple guarded objects at the same time, this needs to just be a, um, extension of the std lock function that returns a tuple of handles to the objects that you locked. That's reasonably straightforward to implement. I want to use libguarded in our signal library so that it is not just correct but maintainable. And then integrate this with a work queue because it would be really useful if a work queue could get information about which resources are needed by the work that's in the queue. So it could say, OK, well, I, have, I currently have access to this resource because the last job I did needed it. Let me take this guarded data and forward it to the next job because I know that it's going to need the same data. Now I've avoided a lot of locking and unlocking that now has to be done inside every unit of work. And here's a little wrap up of the various libraries and um, various projects that Barbara and I have worked on. Obviously, this was talking a lot about libguarded. There's also Copper Spice, the CS Signal Library, which we spoke about earlier in this conference, and some demos of the Copper Spice Library. Diamond is a wonderful programmer's editor. DoxyPress and DoxyPress app, which we spoke about earlier. Source code for libguarded will be uploaded this afternoon. Source code for libguarded will be up soon here. And there's all the information about how to contact us for questions. Uh, how is LibGuarded licensed? Ah, excellent question. I completely forgot to put that on the slide. It's licensed under the BSD2 clause license, um, which I believe is one of the more permissive ones. If anybody has suggestions for something even more permissive, I'll entertain that. I've heard many people suggest the boost license. Um, it is far more complex than the BSD license, and I see people claiming that it's more permissive, but I'm not sure how it can be more complex and more permissive at the same time. Um, haven't. Yeah, uh, uh, I would not be surprised at some point to see some variant of this being useful and included in the standard. I would obviously love to see that. Um, it's currently in the state where I don't think it would even be viable for putting in a TS because we don't have any experience with it. This is a new technique, and I'm sure there will be um, fundamental API issues that need to be worked out as time goes by. How 
how does this evolve if transactional memory support in the hardware becomes commonplace? Um, I won't really care because I'll be using my flying car to get to work, would be my initial answer, but that's a little off the cuff. Um, I, I don't know how this would interact with transactional memory because I don't know what sort of transactional memory might actually be able to make it into the hardware and into the standard in a usable and performance, uh, a reasonable performance form. Yeah, um, so there are, there are some architectures that are moving in that direction. It's, it's not clear what's going to actually end up there. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I am definitely not an expert on transactional memory, neither the hardware implementations of it nor the direction that the standard might potentially be moving in. But it's significantly more complex from what I've looked at the various things that are being proposed for C++ in terms of transactional memory. It involves a lot of decorating of your functions and which objects they're going to access. And it's, in my mind, a lot more machinery than this library. Other questions? Anything else? All right, thank you very much.